On Friday, September 28th, the Norris Group proudly presents its 11th annual award-winning black tie event, I Survived Real Estate. An incredible lineup of industry experts will join Bruce Norris to discuss perplexing industry trends, head-scratching legislation, tech disruption, and opportunities emerging for real estate professionals. All proceeds from the event benefit Make-A-Wish and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This event is not possible without the generous help of the following platinum partners. The San Diego Creative Real Estate Investors Association, Invest Club, Inland Empire Real Estate Investment Club, Think Realty, Wilson Investment Properties, Coach Fullerton, First Lending Solutions, Property Radar, the Apartment Owners Association, MVT Productions, and Realty 411. Visit isurvivedrealestate.com for event information and see Amazon Prime or YouTube for past events. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name is Bruce Norris, and today our special guest is Dan Dunmoyer. Uh, Dan is president and CEO of the California Builders Industry Association. Dan oversees and manages all aspects of the association. He is a respected and recognized leader, strongly committed to ensuring that the CBIA continues to be the leading voice of housing in California and efforts to ensure the American dream of home ownership is attainable for all Californians. He is the son of a small home builder from Southern California and a veteran of California public policy issues. He served as president and CEO of the Personal Insurance Federation of California from 96 to 2005 as Deputy Chief of Staff and Cabinet Secretary for Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, and most recently as Senior Vice President and Head of Government Affairs for Zurich and Farmers Insurance Companies. Uh, Dan, we welcome you to our show. Thank you. It's an honor to be on. Um, the main job of CBIA uh, for the membership, what what do you guys do and, and how do the membership benefit? Well, ben- the members benefit so primarily we the voice for home builders, and our role and our goal is to make it easier for home builders to build homes as affordably as possible in every single square foot of the state of California. So for us, it's always a challenge of providing clear public policy to help assist them, assist our builders in achieving their goal of just building more homes in many places as possible. Um. How is the process to obtain approval for a housing project different different in California than in other states? Well, we do have 17 of the 20 largest home builders in the U.S. and that's in at least uh, 35 or 40 of the other states in the U.S. and it's many many faceted ways, but particularly it's time and delay. So to build a home in the state of Texas, you look at a piece of land, you ask the question. What's it going to be like in the Texas economy in this city in the next six months? When you look at the same size and piece of land in the state of California, you ask the question, what is it going to be like in 15 years to build on this piece of land? And the next closest state uh, to time delay in California right now is probably Florida, and it's 18 months versus 15 years. So that's the biggest challenge is time delay and the ability to get a project from thought to um, actual sale of a home just takes so much longer in California than any other place in the U.S. Okay, that's I, my mouth went open when you said what you said in time um, because of the risk involved and how many things could change and how many cycles you'd go through to, before you get to the finish line. I mean, honestly, I, I if I was on the other side of that, I think I would just say, I think I'll pass. Well, and many home builders do. Uh, it t- does take a lot of courage. And as you pointed out so accurately, there's so much risk here. So the ability to calculate that risk is very difficult. Um, and so what you find, though, is there are still developers and home builders who are willing to take the risk, primarily because you can't move your land. Um, if there's some way you could move your <laughs> land, you could try to build elsewhere. But for the time being, there still is quite a bit of land in California, and um, and there's a tremendous demand for housing, so the risk is a risk that home builders are taking, but they're taking it much more cautiously than before because of that very concern. If you invest a lot of money and start building and the market turns on you, as we saw in 2008, 
half of California builders went out of business and never came back. And that's why the, the risk you noted is such a profound risk. When your dad was building homes, just curious, what, what, were they, uh, what era was that in? What years was that in? And how was the process different? So my dad goes way back to the 50s. He built some of the first cantilever homes in the Hollywood Hills. Okay. And uh, was challenged by the fact that it was so expensive. It cost anywhere from eighteen to $20,000 to build a home. <laughs> yeah. So I know. How's that for a number? Uh, but he then said, let's go to a more affordable place. And so he chose a small community in Southern California called Hemet, which is about 100 miles south of Los Angeles. And he built the first apartments in the city of Hemet. And uh, there, I mean, there were challenges in that they were kind of scared about these newfangled things called apartments. Uh, most people who couldn't afford a home lived in a, a motel. Um, and so they made them put in these things called sidewalks and streetlights and sewer systems uh, that didn't exist before in that city back in the 60s. Um, and then from there began building, continuing building and built single family residential homes through the 70s, 80s, and early 90s. So, uh, but through that process, First, for the first time, when we started to see, you know, together, um, that you know there were these things called developer fees and there was these delay concepts. But again, it was much, much easier once he found some land to turn that from dirt to sticks and bricks, and that would take months and not years. And so that's the difference that I see between the '60s, '70s, and '80s, and even early '90s in 2018. Building permit costs, California versus other states. You know, catast catastrophically and, and enormously different. Um, I say catastrophically because it really is what's driving the cost of housing through the roof. So a fee permit in most states, almost every other state, ranges, you know, from a low of hundreds of dollars to a high in those other states of maybe six to 10000 In California, I mean, just we had a hearing on Monday. The question was asked of uh, Shea Holmes' executive, you know, how, how much does it cost to build in Livermore in this person's, uh, this legislator's district? It's $130,000 in fees in Livermore. It's 170000 in parts of San Diego. And it's considered a steal in California if you can move through the developer fee process for under $50,000. Again, there's no other state in the nation that even gets close to that, almost by a factor of 10. So, I mean, those are one of the key drivers. People ask, why does it cost so much to buy a home and build a home in California, so much of it is nothing to do with sticks and bricks. It has so much to do with time delay, fees, and other uh, factors that really add to the delay process. You know, uh, it's frustrating when you when to hear you say that, and I really appreciate you're so informed because of the numbers. Um, I'm building in Florida, and so I, I do pull those permits for eight thousand dollars and do buy a building lot for ten. And you construct a home that is actually possible to be a small first-time occupant because it's all the other pieces are affordable. So all these other pieces in California almost prevent you from building the very product that's got to be the, where the shortage is. No question, that's exactly correct. I mean, right now the average home statewide in California is about five hundred seventy-five thousand to six hundred thousand. That's the average. You can find parts of Riverside County or Central Valley of California where you can find a three hundred fifty or three hundred eighty thousand dollar home. But the national average when compared to California, California is two and a half times the national average. If you're fortunate enough to live in San Jose or San Francisco, you will pay eight to nine times more than the national average for a home. Right now in San Francisco, the average, this is not a palace, the average home is approximately $1.5 to $1.6 million. A home like that, which you can build in Florida for three hundred fifty dollars or 400000 in Texas for two hundred eighty dollars to 300000 So that's what's driving our crisis in California, what we call the housing crisis, is it really is very difficult for even people who make substantial sums of money, like an engineer at Facebook who makes 180000 he can't qualify to buy it buy or build a home in San Jose, he's got to commute two hours in you know, to work, and even a husband and wife are working at Facebook have to commute in from the Central Valley to find an affordable place to live, even if the combined income are over $300,000. So what is the unintended consequence of that? You you can't afford to buy a home. What, what, what occurs? First of all, building numbers are, 
are down. We've had a stretch of, what, about eight years of price increases now. And the number of single-family homes being constructed mimics a recession number. You're right about that. The number of permits pulled last year in California were roughly, according to Curb, um, one of the data analytics um, research groups in the state, was about 110 to 115,000 permits. That includes Just apartments, keep, right? Yeah, it's, it's both single-family and multifamily residents. Right. So almost half and half roughly last year of those two entities. Uh, the demand just based on birth uh, and growth of population, California, according to the California Housing and Community Development Department, is 180,000. So in other words, just to maintain the status quo of demand, you need to build 180,000 homes just based on birth and population growth. And we're building 110 to 1, we're pulling 110 to 120 permits. We're building roughly the same number. So we're not keeping up with demand just based on population. And, you know, depending on which study you look at, McKinsey or what Gavin Newsom, who's a candidate for governor, says, you know, our housing stock need is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2 million uh, to 3 million homes. So the demand is off the charts. But as you pointed out, we're building at the recessionary levels because the costs are so prohibitive and the ability for traditional home buyers to access this market is getting more and more difficult every day. Okay. Are we, are we having people... Uh, that would be buyers, are they migrating out to somewhere that they can afford? Very much so. And, you know, California is a, a great state to live in. I've lived in here since I was born. And, um, but the challenge is the quality of life gets really questioned because of that requirement to migrate out. So it is not uncommon in this great state for a person to have a 25 hour a week commute. So, you know, we're talking wow. a lot of time. Uh, but if you're driving in from Riverside County to work in Los Angeles or from Merced to work in San Jose or San Francisco or Sacramento to work in San Francisco, most of the law enforcement or first responders in San Francisco do not live there. School teachers do not live there. It's impossible. Only 0.5% of school teachers get qualified for a house in San Francisco. So where they live, they live an hour or two hours away. And so that may not be very many miles, but that's how long they're in their car. And as a result of that, you're spending four hours a day in your car, five days a week, 20 hours, 20 to 25 hours. It's not an uncommon commute. Now think about that. you got a young family. You're spending most of your time in the car. And you might be fortunate enough to kiss your kids goodnight. They might be awake when you get home, but many times they're not. And mm. that's what's also creating this challenge for the home buyer is, the commute, the quality of life, all this is being impacted by the inability to build the affordable home. The the affordability number, I mean, I'm really familiar with the history of that. And last year, for most of the year, California was at 31% affordability. And that number is not really considered low for affordability. Uh, in 89 and 2005, we were at 17% affordability and California managed to build over 155,000 single-family homes in those years when affordability was 17. And now we're, let's say last year we're at 31, and we built over just over 55,000, 100,000 less. So I, I'm trying to understand the math of it. Affordability was a lot lower, and we had a lot more building going on. What What is the difference? Great question, and one we're still trying to unravel. But um, what we are seeing is we have this tremendous schizophrenia right now from a public policy perspective. I have not met an elected official or an appointed official who doesn't recognize or even call out the, the housing crisis we have. So that is, I mean, that's the good news. The good news is there's a recognition, there's a problem. The challenge is the policies, the regulations, the actions on a local, state, and federal level are not making it easier to build in California. And frankly, we're making it much harder. And so a lot more regulations have been added in that last decade. The cost of building has gone up, even though, you know, during that time cycle um, to actually build the homes. Um, you know, the state regulations that, that create delay in the state laws, such as CEQA, which is our Environmental Equality Act, and then even federal issues, we find ourselves getting through all the hoops and hurdles, and then we run into the Army Corps of Engineers who decides uh, to say that what the state's recommending from an environmental perspective is unacceptable. This even occurred in the Obama and the Jerry Brown administration, two similar parties, but still two different bureaucracies that would create delay 
confusion and requirements for us to redo or re reschedule how we would build things. So that last decade, we really have become a state where we say we need homes, but our policies and our regulations and our approval processes completely contradict that statement. Is it um, is it solvable and and how? Well, I do think it is solvable. It really does require, in a sense, sort of like a Marshall Plan, like we had after World War II when we built homes. It requires uh, the desire and the will and the commitment to set a goal and remove the impediments to get there. Um, I am quite convinced that you know both of the candidates for governor in California have expressed a commitment to build more housing. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Newsom has expressed a, a number of 425,000 homes a year, which we've never done in California, but it's a great aspiration. And Mr. Cox has also stated a very similar number. And the way you can do that is to incentivize local governments to get out of their own way to build homes, is to work with state agencies and say, as a governor, this is what I want to accomplish. And so I will put together an internal group that will look at all the different projects that we as a state are delaying and ask the question, why? And ask, what can be done to change those? I mean, there's probably 50,000 homes that can be built between New Hall and Tejon Ranch within the next three or four years if bureaucracy would get out of the way. And that's just two projects. So, you know, to me, it is having the will as leaders of the state to step in and say, we will take the necessary steps, we'll protect the environment, we'll create good roads, we'll require good schools, we'll have good fire departments and police departments, but we will build them. We will build these things and we'll do it quickly. And so I do think there is the path to do it, and we certainly have the home builders who are willing to do it and have these great, great home products to sell, but it will require someone to really break through that bureaucracy and make the goal a realistic goal and then execute on it. When you talk about permit costs being, you know, in the ballpark of uh, of the cheap side, fifty grand, and some one hundred and fifty grand, and you go to Florida and it's it's ten, where does why is all that money necessary in California and not in Florida? How do how do we survive? How, how do they survive on ten grand and we have to have a hundred? Well, I mean, a lot of it is our tax policies. So um, local governments. Are trying to find ways to increase, even though their revenues and tax revenues have grown very fast because of home prices and property taxes, you know, go up when the value of homes goes up. Um, we have a tax system in California that basically takes a lot of the local tax monies and puts it into the state coffers. And so as a result of that, many local governments um, place these large fees to fund their governments. Now, what's so sad about this is the new home builder and the new home buyer are bearing the brunt of those excessive fees, uh, which not only drive up the cost for the new homes, but they also pull up all the costs of the existing home stock. So for us, it really is to look at the overall tax structure and just to look at the fact that you have to make a decision as a state that if we have needs, like we have pension shortfalls, we have the inability to pay for our arts and our philharmonics and other things, that has to be borne by all the taxpayers, not just by the new home buyer. But our policy in California is um, because there's no limit whatsoever on fees you can place on new home development, we'll pay for everything through that process. And we're in Florida or Texas or Utah or Arizona, that's borne by the community. In California, that's that's borne by the new home buyer. And that's what's just pushing this price point um, you know, to the stratosphere. It's also in the process of delay, delay combined with those those fees, it's also pushing the cost of the stratosphere. Any legislation in in place or on the way to uh, to help things out? You know, well, this year we did um, actively sponsor a number of bills, which you called housing creators. And we actually opposed a number of bills that we also labeled as housing killers. <laughs> and there have been some steps taken. Um, last year, the last legislative year, about 15 bills were enacted. I mean, the good news is those generally were positive, uh, but most of it was to try to calculate what the problem is, try to truly understand what's going on. So it's more of a data collection effort than it is a home building effort. This year, we did put a couple bills, you know, into the the hopper in an effort to try to address some things. One was a bill by Assemblymember Daly called the Housing Accountability Act to remove the ability for local governments to create what we thought were straw men that would uh, make it more difficult to build. Um, 
And so we are taking some of those regulatory impediments out of the system, but right now they've been baby steps. And our hope is with a new administration and a new focus of attention on housing, there can be some much more substantive legislation that addresses delay in cost and complexity. Um, in 2020, do we have an, a requirement now for new homes to have solar? That's correct. The California Energy Commission has adopted regulations that require new homes that are built after 2020 to have a solar component uh, within their, their housing built. Okay. Is that, is that an unusual thing, uh, California is doing it and, say, Florida is not? It is in the sense that it's a mandate. I mean, most um, consumers will review the option of solar, as you know, especially if you're living in a sun state like Florida or, or Arizona or Texas or California, and opt in your own on your own. So what's unique here is the mandate nature of it. Um, the good news is because we have a, a technical expert in California called Bob Raymer who works here at CBIA who worked closely with the CEC to make the requirements uh, basically manageable and actually cost-effective so that you know, instead of having um, enormous amounts of solar placed on your roof, and a modest amount can be placed that will effectively offset the cost associated with building that over time. It makes it more doable. We also are able to have storage in California to offset this. And one of the things that the regulations allow for is for us to partner with utilities who have solar farms. And as long as we're bringing in solar energy, we don't even need to have a solar panel on top of the roof. Uh, we are, we still comply with the law to achieve the use of solar within the, the home energy uh, process. So it is a flexible regulation that we think we can work with and to enter into those re relationships with the uh, utility industry maybe only costs about $200 to actually comply with the regulation. So if you put the solar roof on, it's close to 10000 If you work with the local utilities, we think we can comply with this new regulation for as little as $200. Wow. So there is, there is some flexibility there, but our preference always is voluntary. Uh, but California is very committed to uh, renewable energy, and so this is the world we live in. Uh, only got a couple minutes left. Uh, the subject of ADUs, I never heard of it uh, before. Now I hear it every every time I go somewhere and speak. Uh, accessory dwelling units, is that uh, one of the ways that we're going to solve the affordable housing? In our view, yes, it is one of the ways, and it's a great way. Um, we're very supportive. We were very sad to see that Senate Bill 831 by Senator Olakowski, which really would have made building ADUs easier in California, was defeated mostly because the attempt was to try to build these without the excessive fees, and local governments and others opposed that. Um, but we do see it as a great way to provide affordable housing. And they, they are called, as you pointed, ADUs, but also granny flats, and a lot of us are taking care of our children, <laughs> but we're also taking care of our parents. And ADUs would be a great solution for effectively assisted living in the backyard. You can just walk over and see your mother or father and, and help them as they go through the aging process in a very honorable way. It's also a great way to, for college students who are living in a community to rent a room from a family um, and uh, they have a back, you know, back room on property. And we're finding that um, our frustration we're finding is that a lot of people who use these uh, ADUs, uh, granny flats, don't add to school fees because they're elderly, they don't have children, or they are children basically in college and they're not having babies, so they're not adding to the school population so that they can effectively add a housing solution without adding a lot of cost to society. Mm -hmm. And so we're hoping they, they start to take off more and they offer solutions for dealing with millennials and also our seniors. Well, actually, I really enjoyed this interview, uh, Dan. Very informed. And uh, California is a great place to live. But, you know, I remember back in the 80s, you know, I walked up and bought a brand new house that was 1,300 square feet. And we just can't do that anymore. No, we can't. And uh, being the father of uh, three children who want to stay in California, now I'm working really hard to make sure that, in fact, uh, we do provide solutions so our millennials and um, a lot of our, our low-income minorities and our, our growing population can have a place they call home. And most importantly, can buy a place that they can call home so they can grow their personal assets, their personal wealth, and have the American dream, as you started this conversation off with. Absolutely. So that's our goal. That's our commitment. Dan, so much. Uh, thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it very much. 
Hey everybody, it's Aaron Norris with the Norris Group, and we have three upcoming events that you are not going to want to miss. September 8th, we are doing Cashing In on a Boom, strategies to make money in Quadrant 4. The market is good, but it's getting difficult to find deals, so why not create deals doing things like accessory dwelling units, vacation rentals, or even adding square footage. We're working with a bunch of partners to create all new uh, different chapters for our portal, and uh, people who sign up get access to our entire learning portal with over 60 hours of information, discounts, and so much more and the live event, so you're going to want to check that out on September 8th in Fullerton, California. I Survive Real Estate coming up in September uh, is actually sold out on the 28th, but we are working on a live stream option. So if you can't join us live, we are definitely working on ways that you can enjoy the show and appreciate all your support. And finally, October 27th is our advanced cutting edge financial tactics brunch. I say advanced because we aren't doing the basics this year. If you missed last year's or if you've never been to one of these before, it's a pretty sophisticated audience. And this year we're going to be covering a lot of different strategies. We've got an attorney, a 1031 exchange company, a CPA, and the Norris Group working together to talk about more complicated uh, scenarios where you're going to want to know the new tax ramifications or entity scenarios. This is the thing you're going to want to attempt. It's low cost and it's in Costa Mesa, California. Find all this information on thenorrisgroup.com. The Norris Group would like to thank its gold sponsors for supporting I Survived Real Estate, Guaranteed Rate, and Nathan Chiboya, In a Day Development, Inland Valley Association of Realtors, Jason Thorman with Coldwell Banker, Jennifer Buys Houses, Keystone CPA, LA South Rhea, Las Brisas Escrow, Lawyers Title, Michael Ryan and Associates, New Western, NorCal Rhea, NSDREI, Orange County Real Estate Investors, The Outspoken Investor, Pacific Premier Bank, Pasadena Phoebe, Pilot Limousine, SJREI, Spinnaker Loans, South OC Rhea, Tri-County Association of Realtors, U-Direct IRA Services, White House Catering. See isurvivedrealestate.com for event information.